Okay, before I begin, I'm just going to ask Sue Rogers to come. If you haven't been online, she shared um, a really amazing word for the church. It's already reached over 500 people and climbing. So it's just a really impacting word for the church. And I've asked her just to share that this morning. If she doesn't shake, she'll be fine. <laughs> she'll be good. Thank you, Sharon. So, I was praying and I saw a vision of the church, the body of Christ. I saw the church rising up out of the ashes, strengthened with purpose and promise, coming out of obscurity, shaking off the dust of their garments and running with a new commissioning. The church was carrying a new sound, a roar resounding deep from within the heart of every individual. I heard the line of the tribe of Judah releasing a new sound, calling the nations to attention, to stop and listen and heed, take heed. Just as there is a hush that falls across the African plains when the lions roar, so there is a reverence and awe to the King of Heaven across the world at this new sound. I see a glorious church shaking off the dust and mire of the former things of the past and beginning to take back ground that the enemy has has held that is sorry that has been held by the enemy for too long the church will become an unrecognizable force to the world in the way that the world has not seen her functioning in the past the world will not recognize her because she is taking on a new form or image that has deemed her unrecognizable she has been hidden in a cocoon of metamorphic change for an extensive season I see the church being resurrected and transformed into his image and not man's image. The grave clothes are coming off and she is being clothed with new garments. She won't look anything like the world has seen before. The disciples did not recognise Jesus after his death until he opened, his, opened their eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to believe again. Then they recognised his voice. Then they saw him and believed. There were many other incidences when the disciples struggled with unbelief at the supernatural displayed through Jesus' ministry that had them questioning his authority even though they walked with him daily. There is an awakening taking place and revelation knowledge is being released. Spiritual eyes of understanding are being opened. Truth is resounding in the spirit. Chains are breaking. Lies, unbelief and deceptions are being exposed. Walls of opposition are crumbling, never to be rebuilt. The Lord is revealing himself in ways we could only dream about. We, the church, are about to have a visitation from our Saviour like we have never experienced before in our generation as we seek his face. The world will see him as they have never seen him before through the body of Christ. There had to be a death before a resurrection. The church is rising up with a new shout of victory, praise and triumph to the Lord Jesus Christ. There has had to be a death of the old and an emptying out of old wineskins so that the new wine could fill the new wineskins. Lest a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The sin nature, religious practices and traditions and fleshly desires have had to die in order for the abundant fruitfulness and the harvest of souls, miracles of healings, deliverance, restoration, renewal and resurrection that Jesus has in store for his kingdom can come to pass. Up from the ashes we will arise together, a formidable force empowered by the Holy Spirit to run again with the call, equipped with the power and authority of heaven to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. What a powerful word. Up from the ashes, the church is going to rise. Father God, we just praise you and thank you this morning that you are working on this earth. God, that you have a plan. God, that the church will rise, Lord God. Father God, I just thank you this morning as the word is preached, as the word is taken into people's hearts. God, I pray that you leave a seed that you stir up hearts, Lord God, that you start to ignite this church. You start to ignite this church that is God's bride. 
Father, we declare it and decree it in Jesus' name. That's a powerful word, isn't it? And the prophets around the world are saying very, very similar things to this. Do you know that you are the hope of the world? Do you know that you're the light of the world? Do you know that you are his shining splendour? Do you know without you, the world doesn't know who Jesus is? And my, what I want to talk about today is that often we know this. We've, a lot of us sometimes have been in church a very long time. I know that I am the light of the world. I know that I am the hope of the world. But am I being the light of the world? Am I being the hope of the world? Am I being his shining splendour wherever I go? And I ask myself, God, why aren't we? Why isn't the church being in the hope of the world? Why isn't it being that salt? Many, many are, but many, many are silent. Many are pulled back, are so focused on their lives and they can't seem to get out of it. And I said, God, why is this so? When I was sitting here last Sunday, God gave me the title for this message and it was simply two lions. Two lions. And that is the reason whether we will be successful or whether we fail. Whether we take notice of the lion who is toothless, who has been disarmed but goes around like a roaring lion, or whether we follow and believe what the lion from the tribe of Judah says makes all the difference. Amen? Amen? <clears throat> That's him. That's what we're meant to do. We're meant to demonstrate the power of God at any opportunity. So today I'm going to talk about two very different lines. And I thought the best place to go was the book of Daniel. He really knew something about lions. He had a bit of an experience with lions, the good and the bad. And as I started to reread Daniel, and most of us are very familiar, I'm not going to go over all the scriptures, that we come to a time when Israel has been taken captive. And amongst those captives, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, decided to take the best of the best from Israel, from the royal household, from the nobles, they were taken as young men to his court to be trained up in their ways and using their wisdom. And those four men that we're going to talk about this morning are Belshazzar, otherwise known as Daniel, Hananiah, his name means the grace of the Lord, Mishael, it means he that is strong, and Azariah, means the Lord is a help. But when these boys came to Babylon, they lost their names, they lost their heritage, and they were called Belshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Taken captive and lost their identity, even lost their names of who they were, they were chosen, but they says quite, um, and you read the commentaries, that they would have been quite young men. So young, but brought up in royalty, it's possible they could have even been Hezekiah's children or grandchildren, it says, down the track. And they were taken in, taught, and they were given this beautiful repast, they were told to eat and looked at, they were looked after. They were given like, you know, McDonald's and KFC and the best pizza. But Daniel didn't want to be a part of that world. He still knew his identity. So he said, we're not eating that. And he convinced the head of the, of the eunuchs who had looked after them, who he had favour with, to only eat vegetables and water. Sounds yummy. But it's all about, Daniel still knew his identity. Daniel knew who he was. And of course we know the story that they looked shinier and healthier than everybody else. And then they came, it says, before the king. And the king, it says, was um, conversed with them. 
And of these four youths, it says in uh, Daniel chapter 1, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all kinds of visions and dreams. And when the king conversed with them, there was, he found there was none like these four boys. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding concerning which the king asked them, he found them ten times better than all the learned magicians and enchanters who were in this whole realm. So God was with them. God gave them favour. God's gifts were still upon their life. Even though they had lost who they were, they were taken away from their families, taken away from their nation. And I was thinking that many times we think that we have lost who we are, lost who we think we should have been called to, taken out of where we should have been. Things have happened in your life that you feel like, I've never fulfilled the call of God that I should have done. I've never done, and I feel like I've lost my identity. The enemy has attacked me in so many levels, in so many ways, that I feel like I'm captive to what the enemy, that roaring lion, is said to me, has done to me, I've taken it on board and I've lost who I am. But these boys didn't. These boys were outstanding and God blessed them for who they were. It says, in fact, that um, Daniel was called the spirit of the Holy God, God that was in him. He was known as the spirit of the Holy God that was in him. These men truly were the fantastic four. They were bold as lions. We know so many of the times that um, Daniel ended up saving all of the wise men's lives because the king had a dream that greatly disturbed him, woke up, didn't remember the dream, but just knew that it disturbed him. And because all the magicians and the wise men couldn't tell him what the dream was, he was about to kill them all. But Daniel said, hold on, convinced the guard to not kill them, had a dream and then was able to interpret it because he was prophetic. He saw dreams and visions. This whole word, as I said last week, is prophetic. So Daniel never wavered. He never, he never stopped believing who he was. But who knows that when you're in the enemy's camp, you're stoic. You don't pull back from the word of God. You never stop doing what the word tells you, that there are enemies. So that roaring lion stirred up a few other people. And they could only get it in one way, by their faith, by what they believed in. So, of course, we know the story that they set up. They had to play harps and tunes and trumpets and every person had to bow down to this false god. But these four boys called Hananiah, I love their names, the grace of the Lord, Mishael, that is he that is strong, and Azariah, the Lord, is our help. Of course, we know them better as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So, of course, they didn't bow down. They were set up, really. They didn't bow down. They, didn't, they wouldn't bow down. And I believe there's going to come a time that we need to make a choice that we won't bow down to what the world expects. There's already a huge amount of pressure in this nation and on us to bow down, to say it's okay. Will we be counted as one that says I will not bow down? Will not bow down. So, But I love more than anything what Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego said to Nebuchadnezzar. He said, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to defend our actions in this matter. We are ready for the test. If you throw us into the blazing furnace, then the God we serve is able to rescue us from a furnace of blazing fire and release us from your power, your majesty. But even if he does not, O king, you can be sure that we will stay we still will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue you erected. Thanks, Jason. They didn't know how they were going to win. They just knew that they were not going to lose. I think we underestimate that scene. 
these boys have been found guilty that they didn't worship a foreign god. They come before Nebuchadnezzar was one of the most um, famous kings in that time. He had the most power. He was a uh, um, taken so much territory. He had an empire. But these three young boys, and they might have been 20, stood before this king defiant and basically said, we don't know whether we're going to win, but we know that we're not going to lose no matter what the outcome. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that powerful? They knew their God so intimately. So as you can imagine, this didn't go down well. So they heated up the furnace seven times hotter. So hot, in fact, that when they threw them in, the soldiers that threw them in died. Thanks, Jason. Now, this second <laughs> photo, we know it well. And it looks a lovely picture. Doesn't it look a lovely picture? Can you imagine? So, of course, there's a little conversation now between Nebuchadnezzar and his advisors. And he says, tie them up and throw three men into the heart of the fire? Of course, they said, yes, 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 O king. And then Nebuchadnezzar says, so then why do I see four men completely unbound walking around in the middle of the fire? They don't appear to be hurt at all. You have to put yourself in that scene. Can you see? seeing four men in the middle of a fire and he says, and the fourth looks like the Son of God. How powerful is that moment? Well, what I love the most is that Nebuchadnezzar moves up as close as he can to the furnace and as he dared without being scorched and he shouted over the roar of the blazing fire. The fire was roaring because there was a lion in the fire with them. The fire couldn't touch them. What tribe were these boys from? They were from the tribe of Judah. They had the line of the tribe of Judah in the fire with them. And that's what we've got to remember when you're in the fire, when things are going wrong, and who knows that life is tough. Things go wrong a lot. You can be in the fire, and I'm sure a lot of you here have been through incredible fiery circumstances. And it's which lion that you believe in is how determines how you got through that. If you believe the roaring lion that just is toothless, has no power, but tells you that you will fail, that you will not get out of this predicament, that you will not be saved, that you will not be healed, that you will not walk free, then you're listening to the wrong lion. These boys knew they were from the tribe of Judah. They knew they were going to be in the fire they're going to be in the fire with the lion of the truth. He was their mascot. He was their man. Don't listen to the wrong lion. So, Nebuchadnezzar says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out right now. Come here. Thanks, Jason. The next one, thanks. So the three men, I like it but it says, made their way out of the fiery furnace. I don't know about you, but if I was in a fiery furnace, let alone surviving, I wouldn't just make my way out. <laughs> I would be jumping, I would be running. But you know what? I think these boys were like, <laughs> I just think they thought, I'm in no hurry now. I've got the lion of the tribe of Judah with me. I'm quite enjoying this time with him. I think they're kind of making a point, really, don't you think? A powerful point. The officers, the prefects, the governors, and the king's advisors moved close to see what had happened to these men. They too could hardly believe the, their eyes. The fire had done nothing to harm these men. Their hair was not singed, their clothes were not scorched, they didn't even have the faintest smell of smoke on them. That's how powerful the king of glory is in your life. That when you're in the fire and maybe you think you've been through a fire and you think you're disqualified, God says, I can take you out of that fire and you will be completely exonerated. You will not even be affected by what has happened to you. Because the king of glory is with you in the fire. 
He will take you through and make you and walk with you to who you're called to be. It doesn't matter what has happened in your past. You won't even have the smell of the smoke on your clothes. That's the difference when you're with the lion of the tribe of Judah. So guess what happened? The law got changed and they got promoted. The law got changed and they got promoted. Why? Because they were bold, because they believed their God. We think about Australia today and we can get overwhelmed with what is happening and the laws that are passed and things that we see that we know are so wrong. But if we are bold and we are courageous and we speak to the authorities, the laws will get changed. The laws will get changed. If these three young boys can stand before a king, can go through a miracle in the fire, we can do it. We can do it. We can do it. So now we turn to Daniel. Now we get to about Daniel chapter 6. He's gone through about three kings by this stage. (laughs) He's the lone survivor. He's seen God deliver him miraculously. He's interpreted dreams. He's interpreted amazing handwriting that appeared on the wall. He's well established now as one of the leaders in the land. In fact, this last king, Darius, had a real fondness for Daniel. And they set up all these offices uh, over the land, about 120, and there was three governors. And Daniel was going to be appointed the top governor. Keep an eye on the time, Joe. (laughs) And again, the enemies didn't like it. The roaring lion didn't like it. Again, the only way they could attack Daniel was by his faith, through his faith. Again, they're not very original. They did the same thing again. That he had to bow down and worship. In the next 30 days, they convinced the king that the next 30 days they should bow down and worship the statue of him. Daniel, at this point, is quite significant. He's quite the ear of the king. But this decree has been written in law and can't be changed. Daniel could have whinged and whined. He could have run to the king and said, but that's not fair. I'm more important than them. We we can change that. But what did Daniel do? Daniel was so sure of his God that he went back home, immediately threw open the windows to what he always did, bowed down and worshipped his God. And they knew that it was his custom. I think he was almost eager to see what God would do. I think he was excited to see what God would do. And that's the place that we need to get to. That when we're confronted with the, the most amazing challenges, the most the toughest times, be excited at the challenge and say, well, the devil, you're the father of lies. Therefore, whatever you say to me, Thank you for the information. I know that it's a lie. I think Daniel relished in the opportunity for God to show his hand again. And when you're going through troubled times, when you're facing difficulties, it's time to know that God is going to, the God of the impossible is going to move his hands. Amen? Yes. So he didn't retire. He didn't run away. He went and worshipped his God. He could have done anything to try and stop it. But Daniel, he he knew that God had already saved him through interpreting dreams. I'm sure those boys told everybody who was in the fire with them. Daniel would have been aware. He knew that their God was a saving God. And the king was a good man, but it was a bad law. You know what it occurred to me when we pray for our Prime Minister, who is a good man, we know he's a godly man, but there are many laws that are already in this land that are bad laws. It doesn't mean that he can stop them, but it means that we can stop them as we back him in our faith. Amen? Can you see that picture? So there's Daniel. 
Which line was he listening to? His enemies are appearing to win again. Who's been in that situation? You go, oh, not again. I'm going around the mountain again. But again, the toothless lion doesn't know who he's up against. He's up the, against the alpha male, the omega, the beginning and the end. So we know that the king had no choice but to throw Daniel into the lion den. I love this photo, I found this photo of Daniel and it's just, it shows the calmness and the peace and the authority and the knowledge <clears throat> that Daniel knew that these lions could not touch him. He was God's anointed for this hour. He knew his God. And the next one, two things, Jason. And in fact, it says the angel of the Lord came down into the den. And I think, Daniel had the best sleep of his life. It was lit up. The angel of the Lord came. And see, I need you to look at that photo. I need you to look into your circumstance. I need you to look at where you are in your life and know that the angel of the Lord will shut the lion's mouth. Amen? We shut the lion's mouth. Because why? If you look at the right lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he's shutting those mouths of the lion. He's closing them. Gosh, these kings had a bit of to do, didn't they? Again, the king calls out to Daniel. He stayed up all night. He fasted. He, he didn't want to lose Daniel. And this is his first words. And he says, oh, Daniel. And I noticed that he called him Daniel. Daniel, servant of the living God. This king knows that Daniel serves a living God. Has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to rescue from the lions? Daniel is known as a man who unashamedly serves his God. It is, I find this personally a really big challenge. Am I known as someone who unashamedly serves my God? It's a challenge to me. I hope it's a challenge to you. The next time someone asks you, are you a Christian? What do you reply? What do you think about abortion? What do you reply? They're big questions in this culture, in this day. But we have the line of the tribe of Judah. Daniel's reply to the king is, Yea, he is my God, whom I own and who owns me, for he has sent his angel. Don't you love that? He is my God, whom I own and who owns me, for he has sent his angel. It's kind of like I have been crucified in Christ. Nevertheless, no longer I that live, but Christ that lives with me. Daniel knew that way back then, who his God was. And he goes on to say, Then Daniel says to the king, O king, live, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth, so they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent and blameless before him, and also before you, O king. As you well know, I have done no wrong. You just slip that little bit in at the end, I think. <clears throat> that same bright and glorious being that was seen in the form of the Son of God with the three young men. It says in the, some of the commentaries it was likely that it lit up so that it was not dark in there, that he just knew that the presence of God was with him the whole night through. See, the power of God is there. Believe his power can restrain the roaring lion. Is there a roaring lion in your life? Is there something that's shouting at you saying, you can't do this, you're a failure, you can't do what God has asked you to do, you are not good enough, look what you've done in your past. That's the roaring lion telling you lies. But Jesus, the King of glory, the lion of the tribe can restrain the roaring lion. First Peter, we know the scripture so well, 5, 8 and 9. Be well balanced and always alert. It's a very important key. Because your enemy, the devil, roams around incessantly. He doesn't let up. Like a roaring lion looking for its prey to devour. Take a decisive stand against him and resist his every attack with strong and vigorous faith. 
For you know that your believing brothers and sisters around the world are experiencing the same kinds of trouble you endure. The roaring lion is after the body of Christ. And if he can let you believe that you will not succeed, that the look at the way the world is going, look at what is happening, if he can let you believe that, he's won. But he has no ability to actually bring that to pass because he's been defeated. In Psalm 10, 9, it says, He lurks in secret places like a lion in his thicket. He lies in wait that he may seize the poor, the helpless and the unfortunate. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. I'm reminded of my little cat at home when he tries to catch a bird. Not apart from the fact that he's too well fed and a bit clumsy, he's not very good at catching birds. But one day, a bird flew down and literally flew into his mouth. I don't know who was more surprised, him or the bird. So I tapped him on the head and the bird flew away. But most of the time, he can't catch those birds because you know why? Because birds can fly. The only reason that bird got caught because he went too close to the roaring lion. But you can fly. You can fly. Do you know that you can fly? You don't have to get near the roaring lion. You can fly. You've got the wings of his spirit. You've got his power and anointing. It was only a very, very dumb bird that flew right into his mouth. And I hate to say it, but it's very, very dumb if you listen to the roaring lion who's got no power over you. He's got no power. He's got no authority. Okay. Thanks, Jason. I love this picture. This is a really old lion and he's only got one tooth left, in fact. I wanted you to look at that because that's what you're dealing with. When you hear the lies, when you hear what he's saying about you, that the gift on your life is redundant, that you that it's it, it's all over. That's who's saying it. A gummy lion. A toothless lion, a gummy, hopeless, old lion. And why do I know that? Because Colossians 2.15 says, Then Jesus made a public, public spectacle of all the powers and principalities of darkness, stripping away from them every weapon and all their spiritual authority and power to accuse us. And by the power of the cross, Jesus led them around as prisoners in a procession of triumph. He was not their prisoner. They were his. Amen? He's a prisoner. You need to see. We think that the devil is such a big bad devil sometimes. And half the time it's just because we believe him that he's such a big bad devil. You need to believe what the Lion of the tribe of Judah says about your life and what you can do. Is there anything that he cannot do? And you rather believe that, a gummy lion. You might be smiling, but you know what? A lot of us listen to that gummy lion. He, makes, he roars really loud. Have you noticed that? His roar hasn't been removed. It's just his teeth and his claws. So he makes a lot of noise, but actually, he's just a gummy, pathetic loser. Amen? Amen. Thanks, Jason. So when times are tough, do you let your guard down? Do you hear the roaring of that toothless lion? Do you believe the lies about your circumstances? Because that lion of the tribe of Judah can break every chain. Every chain, every chain. It's not some chains. And I actually posted something just recently that it says in the scripture that he frees us a thousand ways. A thousand ways he can free us. There's not anything in your life that you can't come up with that he can't free you from. And sometimes we think, no, you don't know my life. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I've experienced. You don't know my pain. You don't know the things that have happened to me in my life. He breaks every chain. He breaks every chain. And why does he break every chain? 
because he needs the church to rise up from the ashes. He needs a church triumphant to speak to this nation. He needs the church to be all that it's called to be. Amen? Amen. Is it too difficult for God to save this nation? A city? Is it too difficult for us to stand and declare the truth? Are you overwhelmed? What can my little voice say amongst all of this noise from the enemy? He's loud, yes, I'll give you that. But I've got a line that's louder. Daniel and the boys saw amazing victories because they could not be moved. They could not be moved from what they believed. They could not be shifted. Even if they thought it was the cost of their own lives, they were not going to be moved. And when you have that kind of faith, God's going to show up because who knows, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And God always responds to faith. He can't help himself. He can't help himself. So next one, thanks, Jason. This is our lion. Hear him roar from Zion. That's our lion. Look at those fangs. You don't mess with that lion. That's your lion. That's your lion. The king of glory. Mighty and powerful. Full of authority. Defeated every foe. That's your lion. That's the lion that you want to hear. And you know what? You can tap into that same roar. I love that we even sang about that today. We can tap into that same roar that comes from the line of the tribe of Judah. I was thinking about that roar. Do you think if Pastor Neil and Nancy or Pastor Joe or David and Hazel or Kerwin's many people in this church who have achieved amazing things, what would happen if they hadn't listened to that lion? What would have happened if they believed the toothless lion? I believe that there would have been thousands upon thousands of people not saved today or set free because these guys believed in the line of the tribe of Judah. I think that deserves a clap. These guys, these guys, and many that have gone before us, we will know many people in our lives and those we don't know, have believed in the line of the tribe of Judah. They have stood strong and seen the hand of God just create miracles wherever they went. Soul saved, people set free. What are you going to do with the roar that you've got inside of you? Is it too hard? That toothless line does sound pretty scary. It's a big roar. There's no doubt about it. He can get in your ear and you keep hearing his roar. You're defeated right there. You've got to not let him get in your ear. You've got to listen to the line of the tribe. Okay, thanks, Jason. Revelation 5.5 5 says, then one of the 24 elders says, stop weeping, look closely. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome and conquered. Amen? Is that you? Amen. I'll read that again. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome and conquered. You know what, I know that you know this stuff, but do you know this stuff? Is it in your, in your heart, is it revelation to you that you can go forward because the Lion of Judah has conquered all before you? It's not enough for us to know. We have to know it here. We have to do it. We have to be it. I had a word that God spoke to me last week. And it was a call to rise and it came, I just saw the state, we know the state has been on fire. And I keep hearing first the natural, then the spiritual. There is an order in all things. God is ready to unleash the fire of his spirit. Like the fires that we are seeing, it is unstoppable. Men will try to contain it, try to direct the way it will go, but God will blow upon it and they will never know which way the wind will turn. Because this fire, 
This move of his spirit will not be like anything that has gone before. The fire will not be able to be quenched, controlled or stopped. This fire will sweep through the nation after nation and all will know that he is God. His roar will be heard. The lion of the tribe of Judah will not be silenced. And from this fire, this new church will rise from the ashes birthed in the fire, cleansed in the revival fire. Thanks, Jason. A church that is holy and pure. This is his perfect bride without spot or wrinkle in all her glory. It's her time. That's the word that God gave me. It's the church's time. We're coming into the church's time. Amos 3.8 says, The lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? And the last one, thanks, Jason. Our lion has roared. We will not fear. You need to know that you will not fear. You have, fear has no place in you because you have the lion of the tribe of Judah. And that's the body of Christ rising up to worship the King of Kings, the King of glory. You have to know that your life is not ordinary. It is extraordinary because you have the lion of the tribe of Judah within you. You have a roar in you that you haven't got out. Some of these guys have, but some of you need to get the roar out. Amen? I want to help you get your roar back. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Don't listen to that toothless, gummy lion any longer. So if you want prayer this morning, please come out. If you want a word, please come out. I will stand with you and fight with you to get your roar back. So let's just stand and sing. We're going to raise our hallelujah. I think there's a roar in there. That's why I like it. Amen. I hope you're blessed this morning. I hope you're stirred this morning. Stir up the gift that's within you. Stir up the roar that's within you and be all that you're destined and called to be. Don't let that toothless, gummy line affect your life any longer. Amen. Thanks, guys. Presence of my enemy.